Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's Predatory Practices Impacting Elders and People with Disabilities webinar. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panel by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note all audio connections are currently muted and today's conference is being recorded. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the webinar, which will be addressed at the Q&A sessions of the webinar. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I will turn the webinar over to Jamie Brown, Community and Supportive Services Director. Jenny, please go ahead. Thank you so much, event producer. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Financial Capabilities Month. I know some of you all have been on the line for our first two webinars. But this is the third webinar on financial capabilities. Uh, we're focusing on predatory practices impacting elders and people with disabilities, but this information definitely is applicable to all of our residents. Um, in recognition of the fact that April is Financial Capabilities Month, we are excited to offer you this four-part series that really focuses on helping HUD assistant residents build uh, resilience and ensure that no potential financial resource is left on the table. You all know now more than ever, ever that our families need to be informed and empowered. We have been working with uh, CFPB, AARP and the Volunteers of America to identify resources that can best support you in supporting your residents. As we begin economic recovery, it is important to keep our residents at the forefront of all policy discussions. Uh, in particular, the American Rescue Plan has offered a new suite of stimulus payments and tax credits. In addition to direct financial support, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought a new wave of predatory practices, and more creative scams. We want to ensure that you all have the tools, resources, and information you need to support the families we serve. As always, we encourage you to take notes, ask questions, and follow up. We have a fantastic webinar uh, designed for you uh, this afternoon. Uh, it will be recorded and sent out, I think, uh, last uh, the first webinar was sent out last week, um, and we're working on getting things updated to our YouTube in a timely manner, uh, but uh, the, all information will be made accessible to everyone at the end of the webinar. Please, you know, um, enter questions into the chat, and we will definitely leave some time at the end for Q&A. Next slide. So now I have the pleasure of introducing your uh, presenters. First, we'll have Lisa Schifferly. She is a senior policy analyst at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and she'll be talking about COVID and cyber scams, as well as um, financial caregivers and avoiding financial uh, exploitation. Next, we'll have Kathy Stokes who serves as the Director of Fraud Prevention for AARP, and she'll be talking about the fraud helpline resources um, and essentially victims of financial crimes, how to talk to and about uh, victims of financial crimes. And finally, we'll have a reflections from the field, practi practitioner reflections. We have uh, Lynette Gerlock, who is a service coordinator for volunteer Volunteers of America. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa Schifferly. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jamie. My name is Lisa Schifferly, and I'm a senior policy analyst at the CFPB's Office for Older Americans. Thanks to HUD for inviting me here today, and thank you all for the work that you do with public housing residents. Before coming to the federal government, I actually was a legal aid lawyer who did a lot of housing and consumer law. So I'm hoping that some of the federal government resources that I share with you today can help you in assisting residents. As Jamie said, my portion of the presentation will focus on scams that we're seeing during the COVID pandemic, as well as other scams affecting older adults. If you could advance to the next slide, please, and the slide after that. 
Uh, before I begin, let me take a minute to tell you a little bit about the CFPB's Office for Older Americans. If you're not familiar with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we are a U.S. government agency that was created about 10 years ago in the height of another housing crisis. And our goal is to make sure that banks and lenders treat everyone fairly. In the Office for Older Americans, where I work, we do research policy and education to help protect older consumers from financial harm. And also we create tools to help older people make sound financial decisions if they <laughs> age. You can find all our resources at consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. Next slide, please. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about COVID scams and cyber scams, especially those affecting older adults. And we know that the pandemic has really changed all of our lives, but it's hit older adults particularly hard, both health-wise and financially. Across all, all age groups, uh, there's been an increase in scams. If you look at the FTC's Consumer Sentinel data, you'll see that consumers reported losing more than $3.3 billion to fraud in 2020, so during the pandemic and that's up from 1.8 billion in 2019. So that's a huge increase and perhaps not surprising given the social isolation and increased online activity that a lot of us have right now. Also, as Jamie mentioned, with a new round of economic impact payments or stimulus checks, scammers know that a lot of us have cash on hand. So as scammers are ramping up their efforts, it's a good time for us to talk about how to avoid scams. Next slide, please. So at consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus, the CFPB put together all of our COVID-related resources, and these resources are available in English and in Spanish. We also have a lot of videos, so they are good for low literacy or non-reading residents. And the site includes information about scams that I'm gonna talk about, like vaccine scams and government imposters. It also includes financial protection issues, like what to do if you're having trouble paying your rent or your mortgage, as well as tips on how to prioritize bills and manage your credit and debt during the pandemic. So please do consider this a resource to point residents to, especially since these videos on that site are really very helpful. So now on the next slide, I'll get into some of the scams we're seeing. And I'll start with COVID vaccine scams. If you could go back a slide, please. Uh, right now, the news is all about COVID vaccines and where to get them, how to get them, the challenges of getting an appointment. And so with the difficulty in getting the vaccine, scammers are trying to prey on this. But a few tips to keep in mind and to share with residents are do not pay for promise of special access. Don't give personal information like social security numbers, bank or credit card numbers to someone who promises to get you a vaccine for a fee. And also people should know that if they're on Medicare, then the vaccine is totally free. So anyone who asks you to pay for it upfront, that is a scam. Now, on the next slide, we'll talk about some other coronavirus related healthcare scams. There are phony test kit offers. The FDA has authorized some host home testing kits but there are scammers calling people pretending to be Medicare reps and asking for social security numbers in order to send you what they say is a free home test kit, and that's a scam. There are also are scam offers related to air filter systems that people claim will remove COVID-19 from your home. Uh, so if anyone gets a phone call, email, text message with claims like that, that's also a scam. Also important to think about contact tracing. We're hearing more and more about contact tracing right now in this phase of the pandemic. And unfortunately, scammers right now are pretending to be contact tracers in order to get people's personal information. And they may call or email and say you've been exposed to someone who tested positive for COVID, then ask for your personal information or your money. So the thing to keep in mind and the tip to pass on is that real contact tracers will not ask for money or personal information like your social security number or your bank or credit card number. They also won't ask your immigration status. On the next slide, we'll see a little bit about government imposters. I already talked about some of those Medicare imposters and social security imposters where they say they're Medicare and they're gonna give you early access to vaccines or testing kits. There's also more recently FEMA related scams. FEMA is right now offering up to $9,000 in funeral expenses for if you lost a loved one due to COVID-19. 
But unfortunately, scammers are stooping to a new low and preying on this by calling and pretending to be from FEMA in order to get your personal information after you've lost a loved one. So that's another one to be on the lookout for. There also are scams related to the economic impact payments, and this slide shows some tips to avoid those types of scams. First, keep in mind the government will not call about expediting your EIP. That's a scam. Also, tell people that if they need to go to a government website to visit it directly by typing the name into the browser, not clicking on links in text or emails because those can download malware that can infect their computer. And also it's good to remind people that the government won't ask for cash or gift cards or payment in any of those sorts of ways. On the next slide, I want to talk about errand helper scams. This is a new scam that emerged during the pandemic when people are trying to reduce their exposure to the virus by staying indoors, and it can particularly affect older people or people with disabilities, where they may pay someone to run errands for them, but then unfortunately that person runs away with the money and does not do the errands. Um, if someone doesn't have a trusted friend or neighbor to rely on for errand help, a great resource is the Elder Care Locator at eldercare.acl.org or 1-800-677-1116 to help them find that type of reliable help. Now on the next slide, I want to talk about mortgage relief scams. This may not be an issue for your residents, but it may be an issue uh, for you, and you can do your jobs better if your finances are in order. So if you're having trouble paying your mortgage or, or rent due to the pandemic, you're not alone. A lot of people are in that position. And we actually have set up a site within that consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus that I mentioned before. We have a subsite called consumerfinance.gov slash housing that gives information about mortgage payment options and how to avoid mortgage release scams. The big thing to know about mortgage relief scams is never pay up front to someone who says they can stop a foreclosure. That's a scam and that's illegal for them to charge you up front. So if someone guarantees they're going to get the terms of your mortgage change or that guarantees you won't lose your home or tells you to stop paying your mortgage or stop talking to your servicer, those are red flags for a scam. And of course, um, you all probably know that there are free help from HUD certified counselors. There also are two protections under the CARES Act for people with federally backed mortgages. The first is there's a foreclosure moratoria until June 30th for certain federally backed mortgages. And the second is that you can ask for a forbearance so that you can temporarily pause paying your mortgage or pay it at a low, lower rate. Um, and of course, for renters, there's also the CDC order, um, which can help people until June 30th. So please check out consumerfinance.gov slash housing for additional information on that. The bottom line on scams on the next slide, you'll see for a whole variety of these COVID-related scams, just the big things to keep in mind are to say no if anyone asks calls asking for personal information like social security bank account or for payment by peer-to-peer -peer or gift cards, those are red flags. And it's important to remember that scammers can spoof caller ID, and they often do. We know that they have spoofed federal government agencies like Medicare and Social Security. So you don't know who's really calling you, even if it looks like Medicare on that caller ID. So that's why it's so important not to give any personal information if somebody else calls you. Another important tip is not to click on links in unsolicited texts or emails, because again, those can download malware. So on the next slide, we'll talk about some of the cyber scams. I, before I was talking about COVID scams and ones that we're seeing particularly during the pandemic. But here are some big ones that we see at all times, including right now, um, and especially ones that affect older adults. Online dating scams are actually the highest dollar loss for older adults among all scams. And tech support scams are the most prevalent one. That's the one that older adults report most often. And then mortgage closing scams can be really harmful to older people in particular who may be at risk of losing their homes uh, and their savings when they need them most. So let's start by looking at online dating scams. If you're not familiar with that, uh, next slide please. Basically it's when you start a relationship online and then the person starts saying that they have an emergency and they need you to wire money, maybe to travel to see you, maybe for a hospital, surgery, maybe they got in a car accident, they'll make up some story for why 
you urgently <laughs> need to send them money. Um, so the big things to know about these are to make sure that nobody sends money to someone who they've never met in person and never send money or gifts by uh, gift card because those gift cards and wire transfers, those are really hard to ever get your money back. Um, also important to limit what personal information you share with a new <laughs> love. Next slide, please. I want to show you some uh, resources that CFPB has, and these are ones that you can order online uh, for free in bulk and hand out in the housing uh, complex where you work once, you know, people are still around since that's where they live. So this is actually one of the few places we can get our publications where people still going because it's their home. So please do order these. This is one of our fraud prevention handouts which talks about romance scams and you can use it as a placemat. It was originally designed for Meals on Wheels uh, as a meal delivery uh, placemat, uh, but people are using them for a whole variety of other purposes and we encourage you to hand them out as well. On the next slide, I want to talk about tech support scams. Um, this happens, sometimes it can happen by a call. You may get a call saying it's Apple or Microsoft or some other name that you recognize, um, and they say they need to remote into your computer because they found a virus. Or sometimes you'll get a pop-up on your screen telling, telling you you have to call tech support at this 800 number or else you may lose all your data. So these, like I said before, this is the number one scam that older adults report. Uh, it's the most common one that happens, and right now when we're also reliant on our technology, you can see why. So to guard against tech support scams, it's really important to pass on these tips, which is don't give control of your computer to someone who calls you out of the blue. Don't click on those links and unsolicited pop-ups or emails. And also keep antivirus software up to date. Um, you can set it to auto update. And on the next slide, you'll see another one of those fraud prevention handouts I talked about. Um, this one's called Play It Safe Online. It has a bunch of online safety tips that you can share in your community as well. On the next slide, I want to talk about mortgage closing scams. This is the last of the scams I'm going to highlight today. Um, and these may not apply to people living in public housing, although they may if someone's lucky enough to be able to save up enough to actually uh, move out of public housing and buy their own home. But again, they could apply to you or someone you know. And they can really devastate you because they can take away your life savings. Basically what happens here is that when you're buying a new home, scammers are trying to take advantage of home buyers during the closing process, and they have a sophisticated phishing scam where they attempt to divert your closing costs and down payment into a fraudulent account. So they'll contact you at the last minute and suggest last minute changes to your wiring instructions, and they often make it look like the email's coming from your real estate agent or settlement attorney. Um, the CFPB has a great video on this that tells you more, but on the next slide, I'll just tell you some big red flags and tips, which are that to be aware if you get any last minute calls or emails with last minute changes to wiring instructions if you are purchasing a home or refinancing a home, and be aware if they ask you for financial info by phone or email. Um, it's always good to talk to at least two people about the closing process, the realtor and the settlement agency agent and use the CFPB's mortgage closing checklist. If this does happen to you, you can contact your bank or wire transfer company immediately to ask for a, a, a recall of the money and file a complaint with the FBI. Now, before I close, I just want to tell you about a few scam prevention resources you can share in your community. Uh, next slide, please, and the slide after that. I'll start by talking about Money Smart for Older Adults. This is an awareness program that CFPB developed with FDIC, and it focuses on preventing elder financial exploitation. If you do give any presentations in the housing complexes you work in, this is a great resource for you. It has an instructor guide as well as participant guides, and it has presentations that you can use to give presentations about scams and help people spot scams, because we do know from research, if you can spot a scam, you can stop a scam. The other resource I want to tell you about on the next slide is managing someone else's money. These are great guides for anyone who is 
a financial caregiver for someone else. They tell you about power of attorney, guardianship, trusteeship, and government fiduciaries. Um, and they are a great resource that is also available for free. On the next slide, you'll see our elder fraud and prevention, prevention and response networks. I just want to let you know it's you as leaders in your communities um, and as people working in these housing complexes want to start an elder fraud and prevention and response network, we have resources for that on the CFCB's website. And the next slide um, highlights all those fraud prevention placemats and activity sheets like I showed you with the romance scams and the tech support scams. You can find them at consumerfinance.gov slash placemats. And last but not least, I do want to let you know that if you or one of the residents need more help or have a complaint, next slide please, you can file a complaint with the CFPD at consumerfinance.gov Last complaint, we do encourage people to check out, to try to reach out to the company first, uh, but if that does not work to resolve things, then you can file a complaint with us and we work to get your response, usually within 15 days. So again, for more information on everything I talked about today, you can go to consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus, and I hope these tips will help you and the people you work with avoid scams and protect your finances during the pandemic. And I'll be back to answer questions later on, but for now I wanna hand it over to Kathy Stokes at AARP Fraud Watch Network who'll share some of their resources and thoughts on the language we use when we talk about scams. Great, Kathy? Lisa, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope everybody uh, took note that Lisa was talking about COVID scams, but in reality, you know, all scams are out there right now. The, uh, the scammers have used the opportunity of the pandemic when we're all in sort of a heightened emotional state to really come hard after our money and our sensitive personal information. So Lisa, thank you for that great information. My name is Kathy Stokes and I work with the AARP Fraud Watch Network. And I wanna tell you a little bit about that and then talk a little bit about a particular tactic the scammers use that's increasingly common having to do with gift cards. And then I wanna spend a little bit of time about how we as a society talk about victims and how we might be able to change that for the better. So to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. The Fraud Watch Network from the AARP, it's been around in one form or another for many years, um, officially got its national um, beginnings in 2013. It is a program that is really intended to help all consumers spot and avoid scams. It's free to everybody. Um, in addition to the educational work that we do, we also um, manage a helpline, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but it's helped for people who want to report a scam or aren't sure about something or if they've experienced a scam and need help. And we also um, engage in advocacy at the federal and the state level um, to address uh, the things that can be addressed in this sort of scam world by legislation and regulation. But a lot of the things that we have to offer, um, they really cross the gamut. We have really great information at aarp.org slash fraudwatchnetwork. And from there, you can um, sign up for biweekly email or text alerts about the latest scams. You can read the latest news and information. We have a dedicated journalist on that page. Um, we have something we call the Fraud Resource Center, which I think by last count has about 80 different tip sheets on common scams. You read one of those tip sheets, you pretty much become an instant expert. So it might be really helpful to you when you're dealing with uh, people in your communities. We also have a hit podcast, The Perfect Scam, uh, which is just entering its ninth season pretty soon. And it's a really great form of uh, edutainment where you learn a lot about scams as you're being entertained. Um, and just a whole variety of in-person and virtual education. Our uh, state offices work with volunteers so that across the state, we have fraud network, fraud watch network volunteers in community when we're not in a pandemic. Um, you know, giving educational uh, presentations and sometimes they partner with law enforcement and prosecutors and others just to help people understand what to look out for. Um, next slide, please. 
So I, I want to make this point, you know, uh, Lisa referenced it before. We know that, you know, if you know about a scam, you're less likely to engage with it. And there's actually data to back this up. This came out in 2019 that says if you know about a specific scam, you're 80% less likely to engage with a scammer. And if you do engage, you're 40% less likely to lose money or personal uh, financial information or other personal information. And this is kind of like the calling card to anybody like Lisa, me, Federal Trade Commission, anybody else that's out there just trying to talk as much about the types of scams that are out there as possible because if you know about it, you're not going to fall victim to it by and large. Um, next slide. So <laughs> lately, actually since 2018, but increasingly, I believe, there's been this um, movement to, of scammers toward a, a newish form of payment in their scams. Typically, you know, you hear about people giving their credit card information or their bank account information or wiring funds from their bank or from, you know, MoneyGram or Western Union or something like that. But since 2018, we've really seen a, a movement toward um, having that scammer try to convince the person on the other end of that phone or that email or that letter that the quickest way to attend whatever issue I'm telling you is, an, is urgent is to go down to the store and buy gift cards and share the, the number off the back. And this happens across all different types of scams. Um, typical scenario, it's an impersonator. You know, it's government, Social Security or Internal Revenue Service, tech support. Uh, publisher's Clearinghouse, and you've just won a million dollars and a car, uh, business opportunity scams, um, meeting somebody online and, and truly believing you've found the love of your life, a grandchild in trouble who needs help. And in that, in that scam, in that scenario, the target gets pushed into a heightened emotional state, which is something that scammers refer to as getting them under the ether. And when they're there, whether it's through fear, which sells really big, excitement about winning that prize or even love, you know, falling in love online, that person is now, quote, under the ether. And when they're there, they have a really difficult time accessing the logical thinking part of their brain. And that's when the scammer goes in and they convince that person that the quickest action is to go down to the store, purchase gift cards, specific store, specific gift cards, specific amount, read me the numbers off of the back of the card as soon as you leave that store, Uh, next slide, please. And why gift cards? Well, you know, they are ubiquitous. You can go into just about every retailer that you can think of and purchase a gift card. So they're readily available to the targets that these scammers are seeking to coerce. The way we buy and sell gift cards in this country, they are virtually untraceable. Um, scammers are able to just drain the money off of the value of that card um, easily and convert it to cash or Bitcoin or some other form of currency. And it enables these scammers to move large amounts of money without actually sort of going into the payment system and possibly raising red flags if too much money is moving from point A to point B. And the more common cards we're hearing of lately is the Google Play card, eBay and iTunes is always a perennial favorite, as are many others, but those are just some general uh, things that we're starting to see pop up. Next slide, please. So here's my bottom line. Anytime you're directed to pay a debt or some other obligation with a gift card, whether they call it a gift card, an electronic voucher, um, a, a, a uh, government bond, I mean, they'll call it anything. It is a scam, full stop. If it happens, get in touch with that issuing company right away. If you bought, you know, an eBay card or an iTunes card, get in touch with the company and see if they can find out if there's still money left on that card that they can possibly claw back for you. Keep the card in the receipt in case something like that happens. Always tell the store where you bought it so that they're aware this is happening. And then, as always, as Lisa said, and, um, you know, report it. In this case, the, the Federal Trade Commission, reportfraud.ftc.gov. Is it going to get you your money back? Pretty likely not. 
but that data ends up getting used by law enforcement and other investigators to build cases and go after the bad guys. So it is really important to, um, to report scams. Uh, next slide, please. And so for this last portion of my discussion, I just want to talk a little bit about how we talk about victims. Um, you know, a victim of a financial crime, whether it's a, scram, it's a scam or it's elder financial abuse um, by someone that they know, it's as much a crime and they're as much a victim as any other victim, whether it's property crime or criminal activity, but we don't treat them that way in how we talk about them. You know, with financial crimes, we think about things like, yeah, well, she got duped or he fell for it, they got taken, they were scammed. We're really using our language, whether we know it or not, to put the blame on the victim for doing something that made them susceptible to a scammer's, quote, tricks, right? Or in a violent crime, we're really thinking more about the perpetrator and feeling empathy for the person who experienced the crime. You know, she was held at gunpoint, they were viciously assaulted, brutally murdered, and on and on and on. And we really are putting the blame there where it belongs, and that's on the criminal. Um, next slide, please. So we actually have some verbatims here um, that get to examples. So these are, these are people that actually called our fraud helpline on behalf of somebody that they know and loved who, um, who experienced a scam. Here's one. I cannot fathom the level of gullibility it would take for someone to send money to someone they never met. It's just beyond my level of comprehension. This is the kindest way I can express what I'm thinking now. Or, yeah, very sad, but really, these women need their heads screwed on properly. Or, good God, where has common sense gone? I know people are lonely. How I'm lonely, but I'm not stupid. So the tenor there is very much on blaming that person for having been the victim of this crime. Next slide. And it's not just the people who are watching someone who's experienced it, it's the people themselves who've experienced it. These are the things that they say about themselves. Actually, I was kind of embarrassed. My, my daughter sort of made me feel stupid. Or I've always thought I was smart enough not to be caught in a scam, but I guess I was just acting out of emotions. And this, the mental anguish still lingers far after it's over. I hope in time I can overcome the embarrassment and humiliation of believing all the lives, of feeling so stupid for ignoring my intuition, and be able to gain some semblance of confidence to trust my decisions. Next slide. What if we flipped the narrative and we said something more along the lines of experience a scam is not your fault? It's the fault of the criminal who perpetrated the crime. I'm sorry you've had to endure this. Let's talk through it. Let's understand what happened so you can spot the red flags of scams in the future. Next slide. And here's why we really think this matters. Um, you know, we do feel, and I think you feel this too if you think about it, fraud victims, they deserve empathy and they deserve respect rather than scorn and humiliation, you know? And if we talk differently about it, maybe the adult children of older people who have lost money to a scam won't see their parent as, quote, the fool, and it will protect that relationship. Um, maybe the police would be more inclined to take a complaint, even pursue the case, instead of saying that it's a civil matter. And ladies and gentlemen, the police may be wrong about that. It's you go and report a scam where you've lost money, even if you are coerced into willingly giving somebody money and it turned out to be a scam, that is a crime. It is not a civil matter. And a lot of police don't see it as such. But maybe they would if we talked about this differently. And even prosecutors, you know, maybe they would respect the impact of financial crimes on older adults and take on more cases. And policymakers, they might get that fraud victims, you know, they're not, quote, stupid or addled, and they do more to address the scourge and, you know, maybe even find a means of restitution, which simply really doesn't much happen right now. Next slide, please. And then there's the all-too-human toll to all of this, billions of dollars lost. You know, we, 
We know from the Federal Trade Commission they're saying last year $3.3 billion was lost to scams. That's only the tip of the iceberg. We know that somewhere around one in 40 scams are ever even reported. So it's a much bigger issue than we make it out to be. More than a million marriages, according to data, damaged by the effects of dealing with fraud. Uh, thousands of people die by suicide every year. And I want to uh, give you a, a, a parting thought about uh, a gentleman named Albert Poland. The next slide, please. Slide, please. So Albert died by suicide. He was 81 years old. He did suffer from cognitive decline and was absolutely convinced that he had won a lottery and all he was doing was paying the fees he needed to pay to, to get that to get the, the winnings. In his suicide note, he told his family not to spend so much on the funeral and that he hoped when the more two million more than two million dollar lottery came in that he would be vindicated. Next slide, please. So what if we flip the narrative? Let's take out those words that sound like we're judging someone for having fallen victim. You know, don't, don't say they were scammed or they were duped or they were conned or they were swindled or they got taken or they were had. Um, instead, let's put the focus on, on the crime and provide some empathy for that victim. You know, a crime was perpetrated, you know. That criminal coerced this victim. They were deceived. They were targeted. Um, they experienced a scam. Try to get away from any of that sort of baggage with the language that we currently use. Um, next slide, please. Parting thoughts. Have you, if you've learned something new today from what, from what Lisa said about the specific scams, if you're learning something new from me, please share it with everybody you know. The more we talk about these things, the less inclined I think we'll be to use language that, um, that blames the victim and the more we'll get this out from the dusty corners and really sort of take it on as a society. Um, next slide. Just some resources from the Fraud Watch Network. As I mentioned before, aarp.org slash Fraud Watch Network. Please go there, sign up for our watchdog alerts, um, listen to the perfect scam, become an expert at the Fraud Resource Center. Um, and then as our helpline, as I, I mentioned before, 877 9083360 you do not have to be a member of AARP you do not have to be of a certain age to call that number and get help to report a scam the data go right into the consumer sentinel that the federal trade commission runs um, uh, you can ask whether or not something is legit um, if you're not sure and then get get some help if you or someone you love has experienced a scam i think that might be it next slide Yes, now we can get, um, we're going to turn it over and talk about preventing senior fraud from the point of view of uh, our service coordinator, Lynette Gerlach. Lynette? Hi, my name is Lynette Gerlach. I'm a service coordinator with Volunteers of America. And um, so I'm here to talk to you today from basically from the ground on preventing senior fraud and the role of the service coordinator. Next slide, please. So I'd like to explain what a service coordinator is for those in housing who don't have one. Um, our role is to assist the residents in aging in place, and that means we could house them anywhere from being very active and independent all the way up through hospice if that's where they want to be is in their home and their care plan can allow for that. Um, we may be referred to as the resource center and also the in-house social worker. So when, when your building has a service coordinator, that's basically what we're there to do is to be their in-house social worker. We provide assistance in filling out forms, finding transportation, finding personal care services and or homemaker services as well. Um, we provide them information about health-related services, mental health issues um, and services, financial services, food assistance, and any other community resource. So we will utilize um, all of the resources within the community to assist our residents. We help them find durable medical equipment, um, new doctors, medical services, and we assist them when it comes to Medicaid and Medicare. So if we need to advocate um, with other agencies or local resources, as well as building management, we do that also. 
Um, in addition, we provide education, we connect residents with technology, we locate nutritional services, and we provide miscellaneous assistance. The next slide, please. So one of the things that is super important when we're working with our clients is building trust. Um, and some of the ways that we'll do that is we'll take time to get to know our residents and their people. That includes their caregivers, their friends, and family as well. Um, we make ourselves available to them, not necessarily during COVID right now, but it's, it's better to promote a open door policy so that they know when they have a problem, they can come to you. Um, and we show respect to them by actively listening. We always be consistent. That means being on time. Um, we follow through and we follow up. So if there's a situation particularly, um, if there's been some identity theft or some, some financial type of fraud there, not only are we going to follow through with the process there, but we're going to keep following up because those can be, um, those can have long-term ramifications. We're going to treat everyone the same. In fair housing, what we do for one, we do for all, so we don't treat anybody differently. We're going to value their opinions and their feelings. They do have something to offer. Most of these people, sometimes people think that they really don't, but they, they really do have something to offer, and we want to take that into account. Next slide, please. So an ounce of prevention. Um, some, some ways that I go about in my building educating my residents and helping them to prevent situations is I always keep resources on hand so that we can act quickly. If there is, uh, if somebody comes to me and says, you know, this money is taken out of my account, I've got resources right there on hand so that we can take the necessary steps, steps immediately. I host education events multiple times throughout the year, not throughout COVID, but when, when I can. Um, and some of the people that I will partner with will include police officers, DA's offices, the um, AARP folks have been to my building, local bank managers, local investment managers, and also people from Medicaid and Medicare offices. I will include resources in welcome packets when I have new residents moving into my building. And I send out periodic reminders of current scams in the area. So um, here in Delta, Colorado, we recently had some, some scams coming in through the phone. I was able to get information on that and put that out immediately to my residents so that they knew, okay, this is something new that's going on. I can be aware of it. Um, and then, as I said earlier, we work with our local partners, and that list is, includes all of them, but it's not limited to. It can absolutely expand from there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just some technology tips to avoid scams. You want to make sure that all of your residents know to not respond to calls or texts or unknown numbers or suspicious numbers. Um, because I have the relationship that I do a lot of times with my residents, they'll come to me and say, hey, this phone number called me, what should I do? And sometimes we'll call it right back. Let's just check it out. And most oftentimes what I will do is I will show them how to block that number. Um, you wanna make sure that they understand to never share their personal or financial information over the email, text, or phone. Um, they're so good sometimes about um, you know, just getting on the phone and saying, yes, that's me. Um, and that, that is another thing. I've taught them all how to not say yes. Do never answer affirmatively over the phone. Um, and they've got really good over it. I, I've been in my position now for five and a half years and, and my residents in my building have gotten really good at um, you know, declining all of that. So you wanna make sure that they're cautious to never be pressured to share information or any payment. Um, remember, you want to remind them that government agencies will never call them. A lot of times they'll get that, this is from the IRS and you owe us money or you're, you're gonna go to jail. No, the IRS is never going to call them. You wanna be sure that they know that. Um, you want to also be sure that they know not to click on any links in any text message or email that comes across and to maybe check with a friend prior to 
just to be certain that that friend did send that. Um, if they want to send money to a charity, have them look into it first. If they don't have access to the Internet, bring them into your office and assist them with that from there. Um, they can check with their phone company about blocking services, but most folks who have, um, mo most of them will have a cell phone of some sort, and you can always show them how to do it from there. You want to help your residents with their privacy controls. So if you've just created an email or a Facebook account for somebody, I know there was a lot of that going on through COVID, so that they can connect with their family members, you want to also teach them about the privacy controls and, and how to operate those. Also, if they think that they have been a victim of a coronavirus scam, you can contact law enforcement immediately. I like to collect as much information as I can first. Um, and then there are some, a good resource to go to is the FCC Consumer Help Center or the FCC Scam Glossary. Um, next. Next slide, please. So what to do next? If you have a resident who comes to you and they believe that they have been the victim of fraud, or maybe they're just not sure, you want to listen very carefully and get all of the details. That's going to help you determine what you need to do next and which agency that you need to report it to. You can file a complaint with the FCC. You can sit with your resident as they make phone calls. This can be a very daunting task. So if they have had, if they have been the victim of identity fraud um, or some money has come up out of their account, say from their social security, you want to sit with them while they call their bank and or their credit company. They may need to call social security. They're going to need to call all three credit bureaus. Again, you want to gather all of the information so that it can be reported to the proper agency. For example, mail fraud goes to the um, USPS. And then going forward, as I stated earlier, you want to follow up. Some of those tasks are, are going to require more than a phone call. There may be some paperwork involved, um, and you're going to want to assist them with those so that they don't forget one or drop the ball. Um, have them watch their mail for important documentation that may be coming to them. And again, this can have long-term ramifications, so you want to document everything very well. Um, it may be necessary to assist the residents in changing online passwords or other information. And some people may feel embarrassed. You want to encourage them that this is not their fault. This is just, just something that happens, and to maybe tell the other residents in the building so that they can be aware of what has happened and it won't happen to them. Next slide, please. So personal experience, I'm going to share with you um, that this can happen to you. I, I, never thought, I never thought that it would happen to me. I'm very cautious about the people that I bring into my building to provide educational events. Um, but it did. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we had a local business fair, and one of my residents signed up at that fair with a, a trusted local business person. Um, and when, when she told me about this visitor that was coming to see her, I cautioned her. I said, you know, you know that you don't need to provide any information um, or this or that. And she was very excited about it. It was all about uh, DNA testing. Um, and, and that she was not going to be billed for that. And so I asked her to bring the speaker to me when she was done with her visit there. Um, she did bring this person to my office. I sat him down. I asked him a lot of questions. And I, I was convinced that what he, that what he was selling. Um, so I asked him to do a presentation in my building, which he did. He came. He gave a great presentation. He took swabs of their mouths to to bill Medicare for this um, for this DNA, and I found out a few days later from an article that that this was the latest scam. And so, you know, immediately I'm fearful of what what I've gotten my residents into, and and there was just a lot of emotion around that because it felt horrible. But um, I reached out to my upper management. I let them know. I I followed every process that they that they provided to me and the steps that we took next, 
um, police had become involved. And this local business person, he had no idea. He had no idea what he had been suckered into on his end. And um, I, I am happy to say that none of my residents were seriously affected. We were able to stop everything. There were a few that um, that did bring me their their Medicare bills, and there there were some that got billed for that. So none of my residents were billed, and there was no harm. Not going to there was no harm that came to them to, to any of them. So we were lucky because we followed the steps then, and then going forward, we took steps to prevent that from ever happening again. So I just really wanted to put that out there that. You, you might be the most careful person in the world. I thought I was, and, and it really can happen, and you just have to know to reach out immediately so that you can stop any harm from going forward, um, and luckily we were able to do that, and that's my story. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I think we're sending this back to Jamie. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, Lynette, and thank you so much for your transparency. So event producer, if you could just really quickly uh, instruct folks on how to uh, submit chat questions. We do have, we've had some come in, but I just want to make sure everyone knows how to do that. And in the meantime, if the um, presenters can turn on their cameras, that would be great. Absolutely. So ladies and gentlemen, um, as we end the Q&A, do, um, if you would like to submit a chat question, um, go ahead and select all panelists from the drop down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. Great, thank you so much. And I agree, we got some feedback in the, the chat that said great presentation. I agree, and the presentation materials will be available after. Um, we will be working with HUD production to make sure this gets on our HUD YouTube and uh, it's disseminated to you all as audience participants. So I do have questions for all of you, which is great. Um, so starting with Lisa, um, and if you all have other, if the other presenters, Kathy or Lynette, have something to add, please feel free to do so. But um, one of the questions says, are you, are there any suggestions for what a client should do if they have been victimized by a new sweetheart? So I think you went over some of those resources, but I just maybe hitting these at home a little bit more. Uh, sure, and I saw a sort of similar question in there about what to do if someone's involved in a scam and you can't convince them that it's mm -hmm. a scam. Um, so I could talk about both of those at once because oftentimes with romance scams, those are the ones where it's hardest to convince someone that it's a scam because they really feel like they've developed this relationship with the person. Um, but oftentimes it can be helpful to show them articles or show them materials about romance scams from the CFPB has materials and there's Money Smart for Older Adults, AARP has materials, FCC has materials. Oftentimes if they get it from an outside source in addition to from you, they may believe it. And even if they don't believe it when you first talk to them, if you can leave them with those materials so they can think about it, you know, over time at home later on, they may come back a day later and say, uh, you know, I slept on it and I really have a bad feeling about this and I think maybe I am being scammed. Um, so often giving those outside resources can help them uh, realize it and of course encouraging them to cut off communication with that person once they realize it and definitely not to send any more money if they've sent any already and if they have sent any, they can try to contact um, however they sent the money. If they sent it by their bank, that will give them some more protections. And if they sent it just by wire transfer or by gift card, um, but they can still try to contact the provider and see if they can get any money back. But really, it's very, very difficult, especially if they send it by wire or gift card, which is why it's so important to let people know about these scams up front so that hopefully they don't get involved in one. 
So I don't know if yeah. others have things to add, but I think often showing people resources from the outside or saying that you just attended a webinar and this sounds like maybe it's a scam based on what you learned, those can be effective techniques. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. Um, so another question that came up um, actually just recently is, does anyone know what percentage uh, of scammers are prosecuted? I can try to take that one. I don't know. Do you know, Kathy? Okay. Yeah, no, I don't think we could ever get to a percentage. And I know everybody likes the perp walk, right? We want to see the person that 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 stole the money from somebody we love or ourselves. We want them going to jail. And it doesn't seem like that happens enough. And I think there are two reasons for that. One of them is that we always hear about the scams, but there's not a whole lot of follow-up in the in media about what happens in the end. Oftentimes it's nothing because a lot of these are perpetrated by a transnational criminal enterprises and they're hard to adjudicate from the United States. However, um, I know the Department of Justice is working harder on this than ever. There's a, a, actually a, a strike force, a, a transnational elder strike force that the DOJ has right now, and they are having success and going after um, India-based scam operations, call centers where the calls are coming right into the United States, targeting older adults, convincing them, you know, of the tech support problem or whatever, and they're having success. Do we need to do more? Absolutely. Do we need prosecutors to know that these are winnable cases? Absolutely. Um, so a lot of things need, need focused, um, but there are, there are positive things happening. Thank you. Um, and just really quickly, we're at the top of the hour, so I do want to honor the folks who may be jumping off. We have our panelists for another 30 minutes here, so we will continue our Q&A, but I did just want to acknowledge that it's the top of the hour and wanted to make sure that everyone heard me thank each and every one of them um, for their participation, but we're going to continue on. Um, really quickly, Kathy, uh, we did note that your email address is incorrect here. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm going to send, if you want to just maybe say it out and I'll send it to all um, attendees uh, while, you're, yes. while you're speaking. Yeah, I don't always go by David Siminski. I typically <laughs> go by Kathy Stokes, and that's uh, kstokes at aarp.org. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and thanks to the person who pointed that out. Thank you. Um, so, Lynette, um, we do have a question because you know you you've done so much for your residents, and, and again, thank you for your transparency. One of the questions came in is kind of what strategies have you used to engage your residents during the pandemic, you know, given the health and safety concerns, and what, do you have, did you have any strategies to maintain that relationship since you've built such like a solid trust? Was it like phone calls or anything like that? Did we lose some of that? We might have lost Lynette. Okay. Um, I'm, I apologize. I did not see that she had uh, dropped off, and hopefully she'll join us back on. Um, so another uh, question that came in was um, folks have noticed that there is questionable ads on social media, such as Facebook. Has anyone taken the opportunity to start dress addressing potential scams on social media? Have you all been seeing that as like a new trend of coming down the pike? Absolutely. I know that federal law enforcement, you know, as part of our investigation looks at scams in any way, shape, or form. So whether they be by phone, in the newspaper, in the mail, or on social media, and there definitely are federal investigators that are scanning social media for scams and all sorts of other law enforcement violations. If I could just add, if you, if you ever find that somebody is using your name, your social media account, 
your Facebook account and contacting your friends and family and saying, hey, did you know about this government grant that you could apply for? The very, very first thing you need to do is go to your Facebook account and change your password as soon as possible, get them out of there. And then also check on all the um, protections that you have set up in your privacy options in Facebook. Let people know, you know, hey, someone just hacked my account. I am not telling you to apply for the government grant because it's a scam. Um, so another person asked, um, are there any efforts to educate businesses about these scams? You know, we do a lot of consumer education, or that's what we talked about, because of course that's the audience. But I think folks are just curious if there's um, efforts for businesses. And I see both Lisa and Kathy nodding your head. So uh, Lisa, if you want to go first, and then Kathy, follow up. Sure, absolutely. There are, in fact, um, at the FTC where I came from um, before I was at TFCV, the division I worked in was called the Division of Consumer and Business Education because the efforts were both on consumers and businesses to educate about rights and responsibilities. And at the CFPB, similarly, uh, we work with banks in order to educate financial institutions about um, different consumer protection issues and to help them get out through the bank's um, information to their clients and to consumers. So uh, especially, I think, in the cybersecurity arena, the FTC does a lot of business education as to how businesses should secure their network so as to not lose personal information of consumers. So there's definitely business education in addition to a consumer education component. That's great. Kathy, do you have anything to add? Uh, just that it's 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 so important to especially small businesses, family-owned businesses, uh, single enterprise businesses, where it's um, a, you know to not know everything you need to know about about um, protecting your website or protecting you know everything that you have um, that's electronic. It's so easy for these scammers to um, to make you believe something that's not true. So yes, it's it's very important, especially with the small independent businesses. That's great. Um, and then back kind of to the prosecution or criminal side. So what should somebody, what is needed to take scams to the police and for them to act on complaints? I know, Kathy, you talked a little bit about the fact that police have not always taken this as seriously as other crimes and things like that. In your experience, have you been able to hear about, um, you know, what has been effective or what has worked in, in order for people to pay a little bit more attention to these crimes? Yeah, I and mean, we work with uh, an organization called the International Association of Financial Crimes Investigators, and a lot of the members of that organization are detectives, police officers, um, people that work in prosecutors' offices and things like that. And the first thing is the police need to be better trained. And this is not a broad brush. There are a lot of detectives out there who get this as a crime and they're going to do what they need to do, what they're supposed to do. But so often, you know, the, the frontline investigator may say, well, you know, you, you sent them the money and, or, you know, why would I be involved? They're going to do it again. It's a civil matter. It is not a civil matter. So, if you're help, helping somebody or if you yourself have, have lost money or sensitive information and that crime has been committed, not just attempted, but committed, you absolutely go to the police and don't stop talking to them until they at least accept that they will write a report because from that there may be actions that you can take. That's great. Um, so we have another question, maybe this is for Lisa. Um, but Kathy, you may have something to input on this as well. Um, do you have any resources to help seniors with dementia or, or any recommendations uh, to help them and keep them safe from scams? Yes, that's a really good question um, because obviously it's challenging if somebody has dementia and forgets the advice or forgets you tell them about a scam and the next day they aren't able to remember what you told them, that's more challenging. Um, the CFPB does have a publication called Planning for Diminished Capacity, which I would encourage everyone to check out. It was done jointly with the SEC. And so it goes over things like making sure you have a power of attorney in place so that 
you can have a trusted person managing your finances when you are no longer able to do so yourself. We're putting trusted contacts on investment accounts so that there's an emergency contact um, if the older adult does get involved in a scam and is spending, you know, $40,000 somewhere or even $4,000 and that's out of character for them, then the bank would contact that trusted contact. So seeing about setting up trusted contacts on accounts is a good um, first step in making sure there's a power of attorney in place. Um, also, you may want to consider things like fraud alerts or credit freezes that help you to um, monitor credit and if it's a loved one, of course, you have to make sure that that person is agreeing to it to the extent they still have capacity to do so. It has to be something they want to do, um, but a credit freeze can help to uh, make sure that other people don't open new accounts in that person's name. So the planning for diminished capacity piece goes over all of those things in terms of powers of attorney, trusted contacts, credit freeze, fraud alerts, and other things you might want to consider. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and I think that this is really our last question, um, and it's here to Kathy, and it, 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 it's uh, related to the stat that you mentioned. Um, you're 80% less likely to fall victim if you uh, know about a scam. Um, can you talk about kind of some of the data behind that or if there are any other interesting facts that you want to lift up and highlight to this group? Sure. Um, I was at a conference at the end of 2019, and it was a presentation of work that had been done by the FINRA Investor Education Foundation, um, the Better Business Bureau, and a professor uh, who now is at the University of Minnesota, Marty DeLima. And they were able to use the research where they were looking at, you know, what separates a victim from somebody who does not experience the scam. What's the difference? And it was in that research, and they were actually talking to victims, where they were able to ascertain this, this amazing statistic, which, and I'll repeat it, is if you know about a specific scam, you're 80% less likely to engage with it. And if you do engage with it, you're 40% less likely to lose money or personal information to it. And the, the, um, the source is the State of Financial Fraud Conference. That was October 2019. And the name of the report was Exposed to Scams, What Separates Victims from Non-Victims. And I think you can find that if you go, if you Google it on uh, like FINRA Foundation and that title. Great, thank you. We actually did have one more question come in while I was looking at my other screen trying to track questions. Um, the question is, what can I do as a professional if uh, I've come across someone living with a disability who has been taking advantage of by one of their family members. Okay, um, sure, and I see that this one, the question I see at least also asked about the family member who took out credit in their name. So um, if that were the situation, then that's basically identity theft, and just because it's by a family member doesn't change that. Um, so identitytheft.gov is a place to report identity theft to the Federal Trade Commission, and then it also gives you a step-by-step -step plan about steps to take in order to try to protect that person's credit. It'll tell you about things like credit freezes, fraud alerts, um, and other things you might want to keep in mind depending on the type of misuse of information that was involved. Now, of course, people sometimes are worried if it's a family member, they may not want to turn in that person to the police. So. Um, they should know that if they file with identitytheft.gov, they, they don't necessarily have to file with the police. That is their choice whether they want to do that or not. Great. Well, thank you. I think that's the extent of um, the question. Um, um, I, uh, sorry, I just see more, someone more came in. Yep. <laughs> Oh, sorry to interrupt. I was just seeing a question where someone said CFPB, they thought CFPB had a questionnaire for asking when a family member is asking for monetary assistance. Um, 
Yes, that did just come out uh, within the past few weeks, actually, uh, because during the pandemic, so many people are relying on family members. So the CFPB did put out guidance on that, which you can find at consumerfinance.gov. Um, and I think this longer question, maybe, Kathy, you could help. Um, you know, it talks about displacing uh, or seniors that have been displaced. And do you know of any resources that can help seniors who are ending up homeless? Well, that may be something for CFPB because of the uh, mortgage and housing support that uh, Lisa talked about earlier. Um, but I would say, Lisa had also mentioned elder care locator. Um, I think it's eldercarelocator.gov. Is that right, Lisa? Or I think elder it's eldercare.acl.gov. Okay. And um, that can, if you put in your zip code or the zip code of the person you're concerned about, um, you may be able to find resources that way. Right, and also if you do go to consumerfinance.gov slash housing, um, that is an interagency housing website that the CFPB did with HUD, um, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, and a couple other federal agencies. And it has a lot of advice about finding uh, rental assistance because, you know, the American Rescue Plan did have a lot of rental assistance provisions um, and also ways to try to, you know, prevent eviction and homelessness. So again, that's consumerfinance.gov slash housing. Yeah, and um, if one of my um, colleagues want to put that in the chat, that would be great so folks could have it. Um, uh, if you could say that website one more time. Consumerfinance.gov slash housing. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So um, really just want to thank everyone for attending, and thank you so much to Kathy and to Lisa and to Lynette. I know that, you know, Lisa gave us some great mailable resources. Really encourage you all to reach out and get those mailable resources. Um, Kathy gave us, you know, a new language to talk about victimization, and I think that's really powerful. Um, and those stories were great, and Lynette really, you know, thanked her for honoring her personal experiences and really being transparent with us and, and reminding us that everyone can fall victim to this. Um, really want to thank the fantastic team here at HUD and CFPB who have been working um, to put this together for you all. As I mentioned, this webinar will be recorded. If you'd like to follow up with HUD, you can um, reach out to us via HUD Strong Families uh, at strongfamilies at HUD.gov for the email. Um, and if you'd like to reach out to our presenters, please feel free to use their contact information here on the screen, with the exception of Kathy, who her email is in the chat. Um, and I just wanted to remind you all that we will be offering one more webinar series on financial capability. We're really excited about that one as well. It's around engaging HUD assistant residents in financial empowerment uh, led by our housing counseling office. And so uh, we encourage you all to tune in next week again at 2 p.m. for our final webinar in this financial capability series. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.